Welcome to Sister hey, Brunch, everybody. Thanks for being here. I'm so glad to see you, Anya. Nice to see you, We have Fashion. an amazing, freaking amazing guest today. She's freaking amazing. I know, she really, really is. Kadi Kamakate, she's here with us today. She's an award-winning producer based in LA. She's worked with brands such as Google, Amazon, and 20th Century Fox. That's cool. That's yeah. cool. Very good. I Very also good. heard she's the uh, co-creator and producer of Lamert Park, which is yes. where I almost lived when I moved here, um, and it's a beautiful spot. So uh, it's a comedic series that follows three black female roommates and friends as they navigate life, love, and careers in the vibrant and rapidly gentrifying South L.A. neighborhood. It's executive produced by Macro, and Lamert Park was an official selection at the 2018 Sundance Film Festival. I will say that I watched you all on Instagram when you were at the Sundance Festival in the spring very jealous because it looked amazing. <laughs> was and it awesome? It was awesome. It was um, so hot our condo burned down. What? <laughs> wait, what? Wait. Did, I don't know what you mean. Um, like, it literally it literally caught on fire. <laughs> um, what? It wait, was did just you like, say it was it, so hot? No, I'm just kind oh. of, you know. <laughs> it was so fire. Then. It, was hot. it was fire. You guys were fire. Um, yeah, there was like basically the, the condo next door burnt. Somebody fell asleep with oh, a candle. Like the quintessential, God. like, don't fall asleep with a candle. Somebody mm. fell asleep with a candle because Sundance rage. But wow. uh, it was wonderful. I had been there before to produce parties for um, an employer I had a couple years back. But it was my first time with a project and a project I was extremely passionate about. So to me, uh, I feel extremely blessed to have had that experience. Um for so many filmmakers, like yeah. going to that the festival pinnacle. is like the pinnacle. Yeah. How do you even start that journey? Well, you don't start that journey thinking of it. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. I think oftentimes if that clouds your decision making process, you're not going to make anything that's going to land anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, we were just uh, three women. It was myself, Mel Jones and Davida Scarlett that just were trying to create in a space where that I'm very comfortable in now, which is digital media at the time where we were seeing um, Awkward Black Girl and all yeah. these shows and creators that are just like, we're not going to wait for it. We're going to put our content out there. Um, so we also were like, what can we do? Um, and we started ideating. A lot of it is um, extrapolated from Mel's life. Mm. And originally, a lot of the characters, the archetypes were friends of ours and oh, cool. uh, some of ourselves as well. And it's evolved and changed. Um, but yeah, it was about creating visuals that we yearn for, crave for, and we don't see. So um, I think it was just straight from the heart and we were just fortunate that we had champions along the way that resonated to it I along it. and and we were able to make it let's you know. step a little even further back what was that original kind of spark for you that was like this is the thing that i want to do Ooh. um so i'm originally born in cote d'ivoire um uh, i was cool. born there and lived yes. there till i was about nine my mom is originally from wisconsin my dad is not <laughs> he's from ivory <laughs> coast and they met in college and uh ended wow. up relocating there and so I was born there, and my brothers were. Um, Do you speak another language? Yes, je parle français. Oh, très bien. Ça fait bien long. Uh, <laughs> I wish I spoke actually my ethnic language, which I don't, which I'm super upset my father about. But um, <laughs> can I ask, was part of your parents' reasoning for taking you there because they wanted you to have kind of access to that heritage, mm. or was that not something they thought of, and then you got that anyway? You know, that's super interesting. I thought for a long time it was my father trying to kind of repatriate and like, you know, a lot of times men of his generation went abroad, were educated, came back. Um, but it turned out it was my mom who was wow. just like, you know, we're, they were in their mid 30s and I guess they were in Berkeley at the time. And she was like, if we're ever going to do it, it's going to be now. Wow. I don't think she thought it was going to be 20 years of her life. Mm. I think she thought it was might be like three to five years. Um, but, you know, they're not planners, which is why I'm a producer. <laughs> <laughs> You're just like, I need structure yeah, in my life. A clear, a clear line here. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so uh, I feel super fortunate about that of just having an experience of living abroad in general and having another culture to pull inspiration mm -hmm, from. But yeah. um, I come from, as many people know, a lot of West African traditions are huge in storytelling. Yes. So I definitely come from just always being around storytelling that were, you know, it's like they were so visual in their description and in their richness that I was always seeing things. Yeah. Um, and my dad is a film nerd. And when he was originally out in the States, was trying to be a screenwriter. Oh, wow. Uh, I have cool. not read a single script, so I don't know. <laughs> any <laughs> and he refuses. I always say, I'm going to produce something for you. And he doesn't want it. But um, I was just around a household that also reinforced kind of filmmaking and a love mm, for it. And great. so I think when I was younger, I thought I was going to be an actress because that's what you see. 
you don't know about the right. nuts and bolts behind right. it. Um, and then I thought I was going to be a director. And then I got to film school. And uh, I realized then uh, pretty quickly that my mind worked in organizational kind of spaces. And knowing from a very young age that I always wanted to be in the film industry um, and I never had a backup plan, it, it just was more about figuring out how I fit in. And mm -hmm. so it was in college that I AD'd for a while, then produced and realized that wow. that's my bread and butter. And speaking of bread and butter, that's kind of a question we get a lot and I think we all grapple with is, you don't make money right away, right? You're kind of like, you want, oh, <laughs> or, or uh, even ever possibly, yeah. right? <laughs> Never, You're doing yeah. indie stuff, right? Yeah. So what were the pressures you felt around that, around making money right away? And yeah. how did you survive, you know, the early part when you didn't have a job, but you knew this is what you wanted to do? Yeah, I started interning at Film Independent Yes. My last year of college, mm -hmm. I was fortunate, and I think it's important to share that my parents helped me for the first year out. Mm. I think a lot of people don't talk about that, but I wouldn't have made it without that Thank extra you, yes. couple hundred dollars a month. Yeah. I was working two jobs as well, and then freelancing as much as possible. So yeah, I was grinding. I was not, and I still am not, below doing anything I need to do to get the job done. I would work on music video sets. I would AD whoever would let me AD. And Cody Elaine Oliver, she is one of the creators of Black Love that's super successful yes. right now. Um, so she gave me a shot being her intern. And it's through her I met Mel Jones, Angel Christy Williams. I met basically my like diehards out here that I've yes. kind of like come up with and have been working with. And um, they gave me chances to be on set with them and to grow. And, you know, you have to have the homies that are like, well, you're not really a production manager by like experience, but we're just and give you that title mm -hmm. and that responsibility and you're going to figure it out. Yes. Right? You know, like you have yes. to have but, these doors open for you. Right, but you have to be, you have to also prove yourself as somebody for sure. who could take the challenge yeah. and well work, work themselves to the bone and all of those other elements that I think sometimes people don't realize. It's like you get great opportunities in production, but you get it because you were the PA for the last seven oh, months. Yeah. You can't fake you got, the funk yeah, on production. Yeah, you cannot. Right. No. Yeah. I think, you know, a lot of times young people, younger folks coming in here are like, well, I'm making movies with my iPhone and yeah. I understand how to gaff something or yeah. to DP. But it's not just about having the skill. It's about knowing the people and understanding yeah. the environment. And, uh, emotional intelligence. Yes, mm. 100%. Anybody that tells me like, what is my biggest skill set as a producer is being emotionally intelligent mm. because oftentimes a lot of decisions are being made like, are people fed well? Yeah. People yes. have caffeine. And what, what are they fed? Yeah, what are they mm -hmm. fed? And, like, what is the actual power struggle that's happening behind this decision yes. that, like, we're not tangibly seeing, right? And those just happen with being experienced on set. Sometimes when I work with people that are greener, I realize that's the difference. Like, they can't make mm -hmm. those discernments, and mm -hmm. that's actually the difference between something that's very fluid and successful and something that has, like, a bunch of kings all the way throughout. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sometimes you have to understand, like, let that person be king. You'll be king next time. Yeah, It's all good. Can I just say yes, something about emotional yes. intelligence? Because as a director, I feel like that's mm -hmm. something that I have to key into all the time. Yes. And I think people don't. Re I'm so glad you brought it up because I think people don't recognize that enough. How important mm -hmm. it is to be able to understand people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, it helps yeah. you code switch in all these different situations. And yeah. I mean, as or being not a, or not. <laughs> yeah, or not. Or not. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Will you take us through two different daytime scenarios, a day in the life of Kadi as a producer? One would be on set. Well, let's go with like pre-production. Like what kinds of things would you do in pre-production as a producer? And then the other would be on set. One day on a set. What would what would those look like? Oh, wow. It's really <laughs> not sexy. As a producer on set. As a producer. Okay. Yep. So yep. I think in prep for me, I consider myself as the ship. Like, I'm not the captain, but I carry everybody and, mm -hmm. we, and we make it. I'm regularly calling and having conversation with every stakeholder uh, from um, the DP to the director, often having conversations with the editor simultaneously, because what I think often happens is if there's a break in communication and somebody doesn't get a piece of information that you might have deemed trivial but could have been important to their process mm. or whatever, um, somebody's upset. And that upset turns into something that didn't need to happen. So I'm constantly having conversation, making sure that whatever our director wants is being clearly communicated to those people, whether it's setting up calls with our director, whether it's me relaying that, making sure we're always updating the budget based on those changes or those mm -hmm. developments yes. or, you know, the new learnings or production designer 
we built a prank car for a Stephen Curry video. Like I've never built a car before. <laughs> um, I don't know what those numbers look like. Oh, yeah. And nor did my production designer. So that's like a challenge. Like how do you build a car? What do you need a car? Like mm. it's it, n- no day is the same. You're always answering a bunch of different questions, but it's about um, having those conversations throughout the day. Also the hard line of meeting your schedule. Like are you not having, you know, are those conversations taking too long? And then also answering to my higher ups that, want kind of the headline of what's happening. So synthesizing all the progress Mm. and all the steps ahead rather quickly in terms of also um, creative budget and timeline to the people that, you know, cut the checks. Mm. So, yeah, it's a lot of conversations and a lot of emails, um, a lot of texting. (laughs) But also would you say it's a lot – I feel like – really good producers are also like asking questions about things that are going to happen. Like they're oh, yeah. really, it's the conversations you're, are, it's not just updating. It's like, look in four weeks, we're going to be here. Yeah. How are we managing that? And really pulling people forward. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, Okay, we're building a car. How are we getting it there? Yeah. Oh, after we're done with it, what do we need to do with it? Exactly. Like, are yeah. we destroying it? Are we selling it? Can we sell it and make some money on our? Pro- okay, how do we sell it? Who has the deed of this car? Like, how do we transfer the deed? Like, yeah. you're having those questions, and sometimes, you know, I think what can stall people, and I think what really f- freaked me out in the beginning is not having the answer. Mm-hmm. But the focus is the question. Yeah. And I would even get freaked Ooh, out. I was like, but good. if I don't know, how do I even know the questions to ask? And like that is an area I say don't worry about because yeah. usually. It'll come. The, it, it will come, <laughs> and if it doesn't, that's the learning. Yeah. Like, that's the moment that's so good, that you yeah. you yeah. learn in. So I definitely don't operate from I know everything. I try to work with people who also don't operate in that way because I think being curious is it's really important. Is yeah. what you yeah. need. Yeah, I'm not a monitor producer. I actually don't really enjoy staying close. Uh, which I'm learning. What does that mean, yeah, monitor talk, producer? Mm-hmm. I don't like sitting on a chair staring at the monitor. Mm. Is that where the director is and everything? Is yeah. that place? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. It like just makes me so nervous. Yeah. Okay. Like, oh, okay. I know, oh, interesting. I know there's a lot of producers that just are like, I have my team, my team's running everything, I can just sit here and they'll just come mm. to me. I don't know. Something feels very weird to me. Like, I need to walk around and talk to people. I talk, <laughs> okay. You know, like, I talk to the PAs. Like, how are you doing? Are you eating? Like, are you feeling good? Like, you know, I talk to everybody just making sure, you know, I have a talk before we shoot with everybody, ma- reminding everybody that we can communicate, we can resolve conflicts, we can respect each other, and our goal is to make a video. We are not doing hard surgery. I love this. Because, I, um, I mean, I think, yeah. it, you know, having been an actor on sets, mm-hmm. like, there's there is that pressure of kind of like when they say rolling like it's all on yeah. you. I like that I could see somebody there who's like kind of not just sitting there at a chair, Focused but actually, you. yeah, yeah. I like actually, to be accessible. Where did you learn that? Because that is something that's said in the industry that it's not brain surgery. Where did you or where did that become mm. like? embedded in you as in in like that that's not how I'm gonna lead because there there are some people that definitely are like everything's on fire you gotta go I mean I haven't produced Game of Thrones like (laughs) um I feel like there are very few times that I take myself seriously Mm -hmm. um you know like Mm. like the bottom line Mm. of what we're doing is content and Mm -hmm. Literally, if something goes terribly wrong, it's fine. Like, right, nobody's right. life it's is not the uh, end of the world. On the line. I know. So. I'm putting my hand up because I have a question. <laughs> oh, I thought you were Don't telling us me. to be quiet. That's <laughs> <crazy>. <laughs> I have a question. So when you talk about this not being uh, rocket science and you not taking yourself too seriously, I I definitely get that. But given how hard you've had to work to get there Mm. and as a a black woman, as a woman Mm. of color, how do you keep yourself level Mm -hmm. when in such a competitive industry? Yeah, that's very interesting because often not only being a woman, being a black woman, and also I've noticed being a short woman. Oh, mm. shorties. Mm. <laughs> I didn't, I just put that together earlier. So wow. I was like, there That's is real. some short bias going oh, on yeah. here. For sure. Um, uh, most situations where I'm realizing those kinds of thoughts are working against me or whatnot, I become aware of it, is not often in overt situations. Mm-hmm. It's more just kind of very passive, kind of institutionalized situations mm-hmm. of like why you don't get selected for that position mm-hmm. or that project and stuff like that. Often I meet people, I think, with reason. I never match high energy with high energy because that just like explodes, right? Oh, so wow. to me, I've had people kind of really come at me and we're just going to talk reason. I had a production designer once that was went off on somebody on my team and was extremely upset because... 
the dumpster we had gotten for the production um, was not enough. He, mind you, my team had like sent dumpster images to him, got a backup dumpster for Mm. him. He never like confirmed any of these things. So basically we got him two dumpsters that were bigger than the one he agreed he wanted us to get. So really his problems should have never occurred. Right. Right. He was upset at us because of this. So I pulled him aside and I just was like, well, you know, we, we got you two dumpsters. You only requested one. We got you one that was significantly larger than the one that you said so i don't really see what the problem is Mm -hmm. and he just kind of looked at me and like huffed and puffed and walked away and then came back he was like you know i'm really sorry and he's a guy that doesn't really apologize i'm very very sorry about this um you know i just i really needed some coffee and Uh uh-huh i was angry i was angry i can't carry it because i this is why i wouldn't be in this business at this point you know like you can't carry everybody's bs about it but you know he recognized in that moment that hey like we you were wrong like you were flat out Mm -hmm. wrong we tried to get ahead of this issue Mm -hmm. you created a bigger issue and then you have the nerve to be upset about people that try to solve like yeah that kind of sense so i deal i think i i just kind of don't take it personally i really meet people with rationale i'm very transparent about money i don't Mm. like being somebody that's like we'll figure it out after no 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 no, i think money is like very fundamental like we're not in here for volunteering Mm. so I try to get ahead of a lot of confl- like conflict by being clear about it. But, but I yeah. think one of the things you said really circles back to what you were talking about earlier is that, and you like to do this, is prep. Mm-hmm. You were prepared. In fact, you were over prepared. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And in and, and doing all of that work prior to shooting, you were full on buffered and supported by your own work. Yeah. So we know you love listening to this podcast and to our amazing guests, but you can also join our community. You can join us on Twitter at Sister Brunch and also on Instagram at Sister Brunch Podcast. Now back to our interview. To a certain extent, the reason for this podcast is we do take some shit personally, which is meaning like the reason this is Sister Brunch, right, is that we understand that we have some barriers in the industry And I, so I'm wondering, like, especially as a black woman and, and right, like even the size now, the question of that, like, in what ways do you see and whatever you're comfortable yeah. sharing? I mean, because to me, I'm looking at Lamert Park and I'm like, I don't understand why we're not watching this show. And I'm yeah. curious if the fact that it stars black women. Yeah. You know, in a There's gentrifying only neighborhood, only that like speaking of one black show, right? And speaking with, of gentrifying Lamert Park, yeah. too, is like it's the white folks in Hollywood that are gentrifying Lamert Park. Yeah, that, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, like, I guess, yeah. Are, what kinds of things do you see kind of pushing back against you? You know, I think at the end of the day, there are certain roles that people feel comfortable with you in, um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and certain imagery people are comfortable with you in. Enslavement, and, yes, crime, um, jail, yeah. no, <laughs> pleasure, and to name uh, autonomy and all those kind of things. <laughs> yes. Yeah, like not not so great. I don't know. It's so interesting. I think to me, this was never a choice of a career. Like it was what I was supposed to do. So yes. it doesn't feel like I'm ever not odd. You know, I'm like not odd in it. I feel so comfortable in it that I think sometimes when we have these moments that I feel very dismissed because of my race or my gender I'm just like, well, what the, like, who are you? That's on you. Yeah. Right. Like, who are you? Like, Ooh, that's I've done so my work. Good. I've done here. Like, I belong here. Mm. I've never felt that I didn't belong at the table. That feels like a, also um something you have to have in your mind is Absolutely. that you belong at the table. Because Period. if you think you don't belong at the table, you're not going to get anywhere because yeah. no one's going to invite you to the table. Right. Yeah. And then be so good, they know they're not having a table exactly. unless you're invited that, there. Exactly. That's, yes, it's such a good point. Yeah. I think that's actually an important thing to talk about is like if, you, if we're holding the shroud of like defensiveness because we're this person, we're also like pulling ourselves away from the table because already it's like – you know, you don't want to put that in the forefront. What you want to put in the forefront of what you do is yeah. your preparedness, is your hard working, is your ingenuity, is your yeah. creativity, is your excitement for the job, which sounds like all of the things that you have. This is what is beautiful and also so hard about doing this podcast is <laughs> yes. like given the folks that I work with and I don't mean my immediate yes. people, I'm just you know. When I talk to you all, I'm like, y'all are some badasses, which means, and and as much work as both of you are doing, and it's beautiful, like, 
you should be doing it all. And yet I completely agree that also like you just do the what you still just wake up every morning, you go do the work, yeah. right? Like you do it and you do it the best, you know, which we always do. <laughs> That's what I'm dedicated to in the industry. Like, and, I, and I'm lucky to be in that position mm -hmm. to be able to kind of like help move the story along yeah. or you know but that that's for me but meantime y'all do your work and but i'm gonna be in the offices being like why aren't these two <laughs> but i think those two go together together because yeah. i find that there are some other folks in the industry that talk about inclusion and diversity but then you walk on their set and it's 80 yep. percent Mm -hmm. White because man. they can't find anyone. Oh, Which I know, is it's really hard. I'm sorry to find Don't, women of it's color so in the industry. Can't. They're really there's none of <laughs> you them. Can. Do I, it. Like Do there's it. no one. <laughs> you know, on Juneteenth, I produced a series, uh, a shoot with one of the top black athletes in America. My whole production team was black. All of them were women. Yes. Like that's Tell intentional. Us more. Tell you know us what more. I mean? Yes. I feel yeah. like there's just uh, so many people that talk about it. Um, yep. And then you go on their sets or you, like, work with them and you're like, why is your whole team white dudes? Yes. Mm -hmm. Like, they can't relate to anything. It's not even the woke white dude, you know? Right. Like, right. he even got swag to him. Trying. Like, it's not even interesting. So, mm. to me, it's about championing those people. And I'm fortunate enough to work in an opportunity and work in an environment, frankly, that has allowed me to champion people. Because much like my folks gave me those titles Maybe before folks could say I was ready, but I was able to step into it. I see that as my job. Yeah, you know, like you oh. have, like you have to do those things for the silly branded shoots because then they have brand real. Right. Yes. So then when like yes. Honda or Toyota or whatever comes to them, they're like, oh, you have that. It's just very frustrating. I've seen it in so many spaces. I used to work for a top advertising agency that was like oh, such a toxic environment, but you would see how people would get boxed out of opportunities because they didn't, quote, unquote, didn't have anything. But then you show up on that set with that whatever name DP who checked out and mm. was it was their first AC with DP ambitions running the whole thing, right? right? It's like all oh. of these things where you have so many people of color that are talented that just don't get the chance, and that is extremely important for me i was like yes. let me have my legacy be people that were able to eat go on vacation and buy presents for their family because mm. i was able to like give them that opportunity in in a tangible way i think that we all operate with that just on the underlying yeah. yes. like surface of us every day mm -hmm. and i think it's what motivates us it pushes us yeah. forward um and we may not tap into it all the time but when we do it's an emotional thing because yeah. Honestly, I watched a trailer to Harriet. I'm, I don't even, I started bawling. I, just the fact that that story is now something that is like a major, like. Did you hear that they were trying to cast Julia Roberts? Yes. No, they weren't. Yes. You're lying. When Apparently, you started shopping you that script, this was in the 90s. In the 90s. It was it's in the 90s, but in the what? 90s, when yes. he started shopping that script, they, one of the producers was like, let Let why don't we get Julia Roberts? I'm going to find it for you. Is she oh. the most that ethnic of us? Because that sounds like her and Scarlett Johansson. No, no, no. And the thing is, like, I want, you know what? I'm trying to excuse it that it was the 90s. That shit still goes down. Like, no. it's still, no. like, oh, it would yeah. not yeah. be surprising. I did to not know Hold that. Hold on, I found it. Let me quote him. Oh, my goodness. The unnamed Lord. executive. Oh, my goodness. Who should be uh, uh, named, by the way. The script is fantastic. Let's get Julia Roberts to play Harriet Tubman. When someone pointed out that Roberts couldn't be Harriet, the executive responded, it was so long ago. No one's going to know the difference. What advice would you give uh, women who want to be in the industry? There's a lot of power in no. And I think what I didn't say no, and I think you probably shouldn't when you're starting out. I said yes to everything. Um, to I learn. agree with that. I feel like. Yes. Yeah. Oh, you, you have to. You yeah. have to say yes to when, everything. When, when, uh, when you're starting when you're out. Starting unless out. it's going to hurt you yeah. terribly. Yeah. Right. I'm but. just going to say, remember, I was an actor and um, yeah. I said yes to some shit that yeah. I'm okay. like, please don't ever put that yeah. online. You know, yeah. so anyway, okay. no, it's not that. Not I mean, I'm not talking Never porn. I'm just talking <laughs> yeah. like, anyway, oh, okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. sorry. Fancy, let me no, just, I not my podcast today. I do. I think that is actually throughout the whole industry. Yes. Right. When you're starting out, you're a PA and they're the most exploited bunch in terms of crew of like, you know, hours they will work. Yes. without meals, without sleep, without mm -hmm. all of these things, right? They're the, like, backbone of it. Um, but say, yes, in terms of variety of projects, in terms yes. of people you don't yes. know or whatnot. But now I no longer have the guilt in saying no, and I yeah. find strength Good. in that and just saying, you know, I know what I can give you, and this isn't a lineup. Mm. It's, it's not enough time, not enough money, not enough X, Y, Z, because I'm never going to take a project regardless of, like, the time or money that I'm just going to check, you know, just check 
off and check out. Yes. So I don't commit to anything without knowing I'm going to be 100% at it. Tell us what you're doing, how we can support you, yes, how we everything. can find you, where. And I know, and I, it's beautiful that you're like, I don't want my name out there, you know. <laughs> Yeah, but this we, is very odd we are going to give that to you oh, because you. it's important to us that people know who you are and what you're doing. So Yeah, I've oh. been working full time for a very long time in the branded space and I'm looking for a next chapter of going freelance Ooh. and wow. um, nurturing and working with directors and filmmakers to put their visions out there and work on content um, that I'm excited about. For me, it's about the people in the story and it could be a short doc it could be digitally digital branded piece um experimental you know i think my legacy needs to be the body of my work uh, i don't have any project i'm immediately working on right now that i can pump uh, but yeah like hire your local black production girl give her that extra 50 dollars a day rate if she actually is doing that work really connect with people and if you have any cool interesting stories here I happen. love that oh, Cotty <laughs> this is for real this has been beautiful it's more than I think we could have thought we would get from from our sister brunch guests and um, I just I especially appreciate your inspiration and, and also your I think the you've made your work accessible to women who might be interested in it and don't know how to do it, but you've also, you're like in it. And so providing this expert voice. So we're so grateful. Yeah, I Thank have to you. say like as somebody who came up like within the production, like I was a trainee, so mm -hmm. I came up within the network system to hear um, your process and what you've done and how you've kept yourself motivated and, and, and diversified yourself and kept yourself working. It's really impressive. And I think that's, you know, a lot of people that are not in Hollywood that's going to be their, you know, their direction. That's how they're going to yeah. come up. And so hearing from you has been really important. And I'm really thankful that you shared with us um, today. So Aww. thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Thanks for listening to Sister Brunch. I'm Anya Adams. And I'm Fanchon Cox. Join us next time. Hey there, this is Christabel Nsiepwadi, the executive producer of Sister Brunch. You will have heard me weighing in on the conversation earlier with Kadi Kamakate. I hope you enjoyed the show. We'll be back with a new episode next Tuesday, so look out for it then and be sure to subscribe and rate our show wherever you get your podcasts. Our producer is Brittany Turner. Visit our website, we're at sisterbrunch.com and join our community of creators. We're on Twitter at Sister Brunch, on Instagram at Sister Brunch Podcast and we're on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Sister Brunch Podcast. We'll see you next time.